So let me let me start. Uh, my name is Pavel Bednařík, uh, and uh, I have a pleasure uh, to host this session, this Q and A session, uh, with director of the film Epicentro, uh, Hubert Sauper. So Hubert, nice to meet you, even though in this remote version. Um, uh, can can I just ask as the first opening question? Uh, of uh, our Q and A, where, where are you located at the moment? Where where are we meeting you now? I'm in a in the, in the studio room in in Spain in the Spanish Film Festival in Valladolid. And yesterday was the Spanish premiere of Epicentro. Oh, I see. And it was very interesting because, uh, of course, it uh, it has to do with Spain. Uh, I think everyone who listens has, has just seen the film, is that true? Uh, I hope so, but we, we can't guarantee this. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I would say that it just, uh, it just arises uh, some interest of people who have seen it already, so they, they might be curious about, uh, about your uh, ideas. And, so, uh, well, I'm, yeah, so I'm in Spain and I was, uh, with this whole context of COVID, everything is crazy and uh, I think people are completely paranoid everywhere and uh, so I think you know Epicentro talks about the beginning of cinema yeah and uh, we're witnessing the end of it you know in a way <laughs> I see uh, so we have some first yeah. attendees so I just need to uh, get them in uh, to be able to uh, to be able to talk and and raise questions so I would just remind briefly that uh, they can use uh, directly microphone if they want to ask the question, raise the question, uh, or actually use the button, uh, use the button, raise the hand, and, and I will allow them to, to raise the question directly, or they can uh, write their questions or reactions on your film, reflections on your film uh, in, in the Q&A button, which uh, we will answer afterwards. I will read the I will read the, the questions and we can we can answer it uh, live and in person uh, in our in our session. So Hubert, um, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, even though we are visiting another festival, it was is a bit surprised that uh, festivals in uh, Spain do take place uh, in real <laughs> offline. Um, is, is it true? Is that like regular festival with uh, just some limitations due to COVID situation or? Yeah, it's, it's in Valladolid. It's a, it's a big cinema festival and yeah. it is happening with uh, real human beings and, uh, and real cinema. So. Well, we, we can envy only this, uh, this chance to have a real uh, festival because it's not possible in Czech Republic, unfortunately. Um, but um, yeah, you mentioned that it it's it's been premiered at the festival uh, as, as a Spanish premiere. Was it a was it a cinema release or is it? Uh... Uh, it is the Spanish premiere, uh -huh. and um, and the cinema release will follow, I think. Um, okay. Um, so I, I don't know yet when, but I think uh, first it needs uh, some kind of uh, exposure, some press, and then it will be in in cinemas and. I think it will be the same in Latin American countries. Mm -hmm. So for now, everything is on, on on a bit on 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 a slow slow motion, of course. You know, with the COVID. Yeah. Sure, but, yeah. sure. But so, um, yeah. So I would I would expect that uh, most of the attendees just have seen the film, uh, and but I would just remind that it's uh, it's uh, mostly uh, focused on. Uh, uh, different levels of utopia uh, which you uh, explored in in Cuba uh, and you spent three years there which I which I found out so um, it's a result of your exploration not only the Cuban uh, reality uh, of last years uh, but also it comes from uh, it comes from a, a book which is mentioned uh, in the film uh, which is called Energie und Utopie uh, by Johannes Schmidl, which uh, probably some thoughts and some ideas and concepts are uh, come from this book. So could you uh, just tell us uh, how, 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 what ideas came from this book? Was it, was it uh, the issue of uh, imperialism, 
uh, because uh, the book is probably not well known in, in uh, Czech uh, context or to our audience? Um, well, the, the book about Utopia was written uh, um, through the, the celebration of 500 years of, of Utopia from the, the real book that was written 500 years ago. Yeah. And it was written by Hannes Schmidl, who is also my cousin. Um, oh, I see. And uh, one of, I mean, like my, one of the closest friends in my life. And, uh, and, uh, and we, we grew up together and we, we were kind of uh, spending our childhood in, uh, in the Alps. Uh, a lot of it, uh, when we were kids and young people, we were walking many days in the mountains and talking. So he's kind of my intellectual alter ego. <laughs> okay, so... Oh, um... his... <laughs> so, uh, so he wrote about Utopia, um, about the necessity of this concept, uh, where it was coming from. It was born essentially the idea at the same time as the discovery of the new world. Mm -hmm. So the new world and the new word that was discovered at the same time, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it, it, it is it is a concept that um, everyone kind of knows and hears, but it is something that we never really can come to terms what it is. It's a uh, you know Mao Mao's China was a utopia. It cost the life of twenty million people. You know the. Soviet utopia <laughs> in your country, you know about it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you are a part of Soviet utopia. <laughs> um, so utopia is something that is, uh, it seems like it's necessary, but it, it's also very uh, dangerous, you know. So it's necessary for, for societies to kind of have models of, of the other world, world or in a different world. And uh, the, the strange thing is that the, in, the, in the book that was written 500 years ago, the, 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 the bottom line of, of what is utopia was, was that it is an island, that it is uh, an island of peace and justice. It's an island where there's no uh, possession, no personal possession. There is no emperor and no God. So mm -hmm. that is literally and exactly the manifest of the Cuban revolution, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is, yeah. which is kind of funny, you know? Yeah, uh, sure. And, uh, and, it, and, but another variation of, the, of one of the many variations of the utopia is, is the American dream, mm -hmm. which is, uh, somehow the opposite of the Cuban revolution, but it's also a form of utopia. And yeah. uh, in my point of view, of course, a form of dystopia <laughs> by now, you know, and uh, yeah. and the, the American dream is 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 uh, is a European dream. It's actually it's a Europeans who went to discover this new new continent, uh, killed a few million people, and uh, and talked about freedom. You know? Yeah, and uh, so so it's a it's a very problematic term and a very interesting term. And uh, epicenter was uh, the idea was of epicenter was not necessarily to shoot the film in Cuba. It was more about uh, this concept and these uh, crazy uh, ideas and even this uh, kind of psychology of, of empires. Why does an empire want to be an empire? Well, how do we how do we people inside of an empire? I'm saying we because Europe is also kind of inside of the American empire. How, how do we explain? ourselves and how do we, we create a self-narrative and self-justification for our crimes also and uh, you know a few hundred years ago it was uh, the, the, the catholic church was a good tool to explain crimes <laughs> and to justify them uh, mm -hmm. in latin america uh, we have many tools and one of the most powerful tools is, is of course what we call soft power Hollywood um, uh, and, and Hollywood uh, was born literally at the same moment uh, of time and at the same place as the American Empire with the explosion of an American ship in the port of Havana which is <laughs> now it's a bit too much for people who haven't seen it today, but who, who saw the film understand that it is an ironic 
film, of course, um, a paradox that uh, that the ground zero of the American empire and the ground zero of Hollywood is the same place. And it's the port of Havana, or even, even worse, it, it is a bathtub with uh, small ships that blow up with cigar smoke. So the biggest empire of the world was born in a bathtub, so. <laughs> So yeah, well, it's quite a shortcut to <laughs> explain it, uh, yes. but but it it's the complete truth. <laughs> <laughs> but but definitely, it's uh, it brings brings us to the to one of the main um, uh, main topics issues in in the film, which is uh, which is the sense of fakeness uh, of uh, of us, all of us, and all the dreams and utopias living being based on uh, on uh, any. Uh, li on a lie, on a on, on a fake narrative. So, mm -hmm. um, what, what was it? Something? Where did where did you where you found or where where it was where it uh, where it appeared? This connection of uh, let's say this this uh, birth of an empire, uh, the, the the birth of the cinematic empire of the Hollywood, which is which is a strong uh, strong part of one of the stories in your film. Um, what is it part of the uh, of the book we were talking about or what was it your uh, kind of uh... no, I mean, the book the book uh, of my cousin is, is a book about what is what is utopia essentially and then and i and i took it as a as a leading theme for for the film it, but it's it's really very far away from the film yeah um, um but uh, you said the word fake news which is uh which is a word that is kind of uh made popular by the guy with the orange hair in the white house and and, uh, and he i mean fake news is is as old as as, as civilizations you know every civilization sure. creates its own narrative on on fake news essentially and every religion religion is based on fake news that is multiplied and written again and uh, and the question is how far it is how fake it is and how fast it is being distributed you know yeah the, the 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 story of jesus is also fake news i mean i don't know what happened to jesus 2000 years ago it was told a, a million times and and uh, who knows who, who this guy was it's um but uh, since the bible was uh, printed 500 years ago this this concept was so distributed and it became the truth what you call it the truth you know um, and now the fake news of, uh, in this case, what I, I was working on in Epicenter is that the fake news was that the Spanish are attacking the uh, Cubans, are attacking the Americans, we have to fight back. Mm -hmm. That was fake news. The, the, the ship that blew up was fake news that because it was told that the Spanish blew it up. It was a casus bellis, the Spanish-American war started. But the interesting thing is that how the fake news was told, uh, in this case, by a very, very strong uh, tool, and that was cinema. Mm -hmm. True. Even though it was made uh, uh, with tricks uh, related yeah. to but the it's, level. It, it is very philosophical. It's very me because it's uh, this whole debate about what is true and real and not real and. Uh, it is very complicated because, uh, for example, 100, 120 years ago, the real ship from the U.S. Navy uh, exploded and 250 people died. And it was in the middle of the night and nobody was really witnessing it because the, the witnesses died. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it, it exploded, but it's also like a non-event because it's suddenly... Uh, it, it happened but mm -hmm. but the the real event what is what became reality in in uh, millions of peoples of, of 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 minds was the image of the u.s main blowing up and the image was fake it was made in a bathtub with a small ship like this size and uh with firecrackers and smoke of cigars so w which one is real you know so i mean is the real one the one we didn't see or the one we saw that started a real war because i mean yeah. that is the truth you know so if this if this fake news little ship out of paper and and wood started a real war 
it is also in a way in a way real it's like a, you know it's as real as a as you know a nightmare and because you had a nightmare you want to kill somebody so it, it, it becomes very real you know yeah well you uh, you are so bringing this, this whole this whole story is, is so interesting and so crazy and what even is cinema it's, it is kind of a reflection of life but it also life is a reflection of cinema because cinema is very prophetic Mm -hmm. So in this case, what I just said, it is it is true. In many cases, we our lives are conditioned by what we see on screens, and uh, so it, so it means that everything we we see on on screens, or the most things we see on screens, are materializing uh, in what we call the real life. You know, and not only Hollywood is of course also kind of uh, copying or or interpreting. What is the real life? But but it goes both ways, and it, that's really crazy. Yeah, sure it is. It's uh, you have a nice uh, nice uh, scene in the film where you reenact the whole situation, the whole uh, battle, uh, the fake battle uh, with uh, with the kids. And uh, it's also interesting that uh, uh, you have the the kids uh, are are basically your guides uh, in in Cuban reality and also you become their guide in understanding uh many things which uh, which is really uh interesting emotional vehicle of the film uh which which i liked a lot because uh, the spontaneity of the kids uh at many moments and many situations is, is really interesting what i was wondering is that there are some situations where where the kids watch uh films and obviously you are trying to uh, i expect you are trying to uh, to present the power of film uh, as a as a phenomenon as a cultural phenomenon uh, what were these situations when the kids were watching the films i mean the groups of kids uh, watching the films what was the what was the uh, situation where you where you captured this moment um, well i mean um, the the beginning of the film there is a kind of a show like a circus show mm -hmm. um, of this circus master who is essentially saying telling us what we see so uh, the, the the early cinema uh, 120 years ago was never mute you know we always talk about mute cinema and sound cinema but it was never mute it was always it was always uh, Uh, escorted by somebody playing a piano or, or a trumpet or a, a drums or somebody shouting or explaining things, you know. And in the early days, what I did, what I found out in my research, most most times when those films about war uh, were shown in, in the U.S., they were commented by veterans from the war, from the civil mm -hmm. war. So, for soldiers, we're talking about now we can see the ships blowing up here the, the army is coming and it was essentially a circus number and and uh, so i i decided to fit, to find a way to 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 re uh, re reenact this kind of situation with uh, with a good friend who is a, a scriptwriter from chile who lives in mm -hmm. cuba uh, the, the man with the hat Yeah. And he said, okay, let's just uh, do a show and show the, those old films to the kids. And I would present the films like a fake gringo who is trying to glorify the, the American flag. Mm -hmm. And then we said, like, let's just try that and see what the kids are saying. And it came so to a situation that they that he pushed really the, the, the limits. And he said, uh, it was interesting because he said a lot of things that are coherent he said like you know americans were fighting against slavery and for freedom and which is true you know but then he pushed the the, <laughs> the limit so far that the cuban kids were almost starting to chase him out you know that was an interesting moment you know so it was like a it was like a, a theater play you show to children and then see what happens you know yeah And was it was it organized just for this group of kids? You were you were in touch, or was it a school a school group? Or yeah, it was a school, and uh, we knew the teachers, and we said, uh, you know, we will come uh, and show some films to the kids, and uh, it would be about propaganda from mm -hmm. from hundred years back. Mm -hmm. And 
they were happy, you know. So, so it was some kind of film education level of uh, of your of this of this event. Yeah, it, explaining it how propaganda a, works. And... Yeah, it was also kind of uh, an imposture, you know. It's like a, 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 like a, like some kind of art art installation <laughs> that happening, <laughs> and it was. It was interesting because uh, the what I wanted to do also is to uh, I, I don't like to make documentaries and and just uh, show old footage and and then me the filmmakers explaining what this is about and it's it's like this is bullshit you know so I, I don't I don't like that so I want to give the audience a a way to experience cinema. And uh, experiencing cinema is it means experiencing something in a group because cinema is de facto. Uh, I mean, if you sit alone in front of Netflix, it's one thing. But if you sit alone, not alone with two hundred people in a room, the energy is so much different. It's not only that the screen is bigger and the sound is better; it's the whole energy of it. And also, if you are seeing a film with the people in the film with the kids in this case you you have the double cinema experience in a way because you see the kids seeing and discovering yeah and for example the the old footage from the spanish american war when i saw it first when i discovered those those films in archives I didn't know what's going on. I didn't. I, I, I was thinking they, their executions were filmed in 1898. Mm -hmm. And only after studying and reading about this, I found out that it's all made with actors in Florida, you know, <laughs> yeah. not, not, not in, in, in the Philippines and not in Cuba. It was just uh, fake. But it was so fake that it became, of course, very real. It, 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 those films were... I mean, to, essentially, th these films led to the Spanish-American War. Mm -hmm. And the Spanish-American War was the war that united the states. Mm -hmm. It was a necessary war for the United States to be become united after the Civil War. You know? So it was like, uh, it was like a very, uh, very, very important event for, for the United States. And, uh, and it was so important and so successful that the United States uh, continue for hundred uh, for one century to do the same kind of uh, kind of wars, you know, to to mm. to help or to invade or to 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 liberate to liberate Vietnam, to liberate Iraq, uh, liberate Afghanistan, and uh, and you know we know the story, you know, which it's, uh, you don't need to hear from me what what the story is, you know. Yeah, you can find the pattern almost everywhere until these days. So um, exactly, and also the pattern is very synchronized with with the moving image, mm -hmm. because the Vietnam War would me would not exist for you and not for me if we wouldn't have moving images, if we wouldn't have Coppola or Newsfeed or, mm -hmm. sure. or Deer Hunter. It only exists. It only exists for you and for me through a camera nothing else nothing else if it's if you don't if you don't uh, like have these images in your head vietnam war is just a word that means nothing you know? sure so um i think we have uh, some limited time so i would just uh, suggest to uh, for our attendees for our visitors uh, hopefully the the audience of your film uh, if they want to ask questions Sure. Uh, so uh, we have a first reaction and question, so I'll just read it. Um, uh, I noticed while watching Epicentral that Mr. Sauper works with very sophisticated in-shot montage, which I think must be very hard while shooting documentary movie, when not knowing what is going to happen in next second. How did, how did you develop this skill? Uh, I don't really know what it means. What do you mean in shot montage? Uh, in shot montage, I would, I'm, I'm surprised by this, uh, by this term. So, um, 
we might ask uh, Carol if we, if we can just uh, say it uh, live or explain maybe a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I can't quite understand the, the question, but uh, maybe maybe this person means... Okay, the... hello. Yeah, uh, we are here. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, hello, Mr. Sauber. Hi. Yeah, I thought like just the montage within uh, the, the single shot, you know, like that uh, you constantly are shooting and uh, it's, it's visible that you kind of work with the editing while just being still in one shot. That's what I thought. Do you, but, do you but, understand but like which, this? Uh, which scene, for example? Give me an example. Well, I'm not sure where it was, but uh, there is some some guy with a, with a bicycle, maybe, or something. And it's like very poetic moment with uh, some music, I guess. And uh, yeah, there is a landscape and something happening around and it's very visible that you are still like uh, super aware of what's what's happening around and like where to where to move the camera and like, yeah, it was pretty amazing for me. Yeah, I mean, I would like to answer you, but I don't exactly know which scene you refer to now. Um, I mean, uh, but you mean in short montage in a way that it's a, it's a plan séquence, like a, uh, because montage is always it's cutting, so to say. But I don't know which which scene you're talking about now. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how to how to how to tell you better. I mean, I can give you a secret. For example, there is a, actually an in short montage, but this is a secret among filmmakers. <laughs> okay. For example, for example. The opening sequence when you see the waves. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it is one shot, which is like one minute long or something, and you see the waves on hitting the, the wall, and then there's the title at the center, of, right? Mm -hmm. This is uh, not one shot, it's uh, three shots. It's a, it's a montage which you don't see because it's a steady shot, a steady image. And it's uh, three shots because uh, you see a motorbike going by. Anyway, I'm just saying that I cut this one uh, steady shot three times, but you don't see it. Maybe that's called in-shot montage. <laughs> okay, okay. But, uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, the... there's also a lot of montage which you don't necessarily see. You know, sometimes it's just jump cuts uh, with somebody talking. I just jump, you know, for example, the, the taxi driver in his open car at night, he talks and he keeps talking and it's just cutting. Sometimes I see the, the background is just jumping, you know, which I don't, uh, which is not, uh, which is not extremely elegant in the filmmaking sense, but it's, uh, it's for me a, a, a tool that, I, I, I use to just uh, advance the narrative. You know what I mean? Okay, okay. Thanks for for answering my question. Yeah. Right. I hope I hope the the answer was uh, was replying to what what uh, Karel was asking. So uh, hopefully it was. Uh, are there yeah, any I other questions? Sorry, I didn't completely understand the question, but it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Um, I don't see any other questions coming, so uh, I think we can uh, we can ask uh, the audience if they want to ask. Uh, just please um, raise the virtual hand so I can see that you you want to ask, and I will unmute you, and you can you can say. Uh, are you showing this this video in the room where the film was shown, or or you have no physical screening? Uh, no, no, there are no physical screenings. Unfortunately, it's. Uh, well, we have a we have a something like a lockdown at the moment in Czech Republic. So, even though politicians say it's not a lockdown, it's 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 quite close to <laughs> what lockdown means. So, um, the festival uh, turned completely online uh, three weeks ago. So, because of this situation, so mm -hmm. it's it's unfortunately it's only virtual screenings and virtual Q and A's. Um, even though there's a there's a feed going on uh, from Ihlava, there's a, a 
complete uh, report, reports and Q&As Q &As taking place in Ihlava in, in, uh, at the square in such, in such a box. But um, yeah, this is just, uh, just a, a, result, a result of the current situation. Anyway, we don't have any uh, questions coming. Oh, Barbara is uh, sending a question. So I will read it again. Um, hello, Hubert. I'm curious about access in Cuba and searching for your collaborators. How was the process? I'm also interested how much pre-planning did you do with the film? Have you thought of scenes beforehand or perhaps even some conversations? So the access was something which I also wanted to ask about. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, there are two answers to that access. I mean, uh, of course, there's kind of physical access and administrative access that you always have to think about in uh, in filmmaking in this in political filmmaking because you can maybe not be allowed in certain places. So of course, you have to anticipate this all the time. You know, um, in this case, uh, I mean, when I was shooting in Africa for Darwin's Nightmare for We Come as Friends, I was many times I had to kind of outsmart the authorities, you know, I, I had to like be, you know, more intelligent than the intelligence service <laughs> that tried to chase me, so to say, um, or I mean, or more intelligent, but at least uh, try to find a way to, to escape the, the uh, administrative force and military force and so. Mm. Um, but in Cuba, it's different. In Cuba, I, I was uh, received uh, with open hands, and I was uh, accepting to to teach in a, in a film school. And also, I mean, so once I was teaching in film school, I, I had a uh, uh, a residency uh, permit in Cuba, so I wasn't. I was a resident and I was allowed to, to stay and uh, live there and I had a very good position, so to say, uh, not being a tourist and uh, having to run at the places where tourists go or uh, I have having to leave. So I had a good uh, good position and I was playing with open cards. I, I did nothing, nothing with like hidden camera or nothing behind the the back of somebody it was a very it was very easy so to say in this case but the other kind of access of course is the is the access to to the minds and to lives and to the hearts of people that's a different sort of access you know mm -hmm. and uh, there is no recipe to that it's just uh, how you relate to the world that's how the world relates to you you know i think uh, if you if you go to a place like this uh, and you uh, invade people's houses and say tell me your story you you will be alone you nobody will tell you anything yeah, um, sure. uh, but if you create relationships and if you are able to communicate to people somehow even people in a very different uh, class or age or, or culture you can communicate somehow what is your what is your uh, way to think and way to work and what you think about the world and I, I think I always start by communicating a lot you know uh, I, I tell people a lot what I'm doing here who I am uh, I show them maybe films I made before I show them pictures of my little house in, in France, my farm, <laughs> mm -hmm. etc. So I create a relationship. Uh, they have, so they understand uh, more who they have to do. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I eat and drink and laugh and with, with these people. And then like with this relationship is something happens, you know, not always and not with everybody, of course, but um, sometimes, um, you know, uh, of course, I, I I anticipate a lot of things, you know, because th th these kind of movies look very uh, spontaneous and organic, and it's in the middle of the night and hand camera and so. But it's also very very uh, conceptual, you know. It's it's uh, it is not. Uh, I, I don't just go to Havana and see what happens. Of course, I have a very clear idea about what I'm doing, and I was so write scripts and I of course send the scripts to the 
film funds to get money because otherwise you don't get money to to make movies if you don't write mm. so a lot of things are very conceptual a lot of things are anticipated it's like uh, uh, especially when you get a bit older you 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 know a lot of things essentially in advance because you you i don't know if if i if i go to film a, a an American ambassador uh, who gives a speech to the Maasai uh, in Africa. Mm -hmm. I, I know what he's talking about. I know, I know basically what kind of, you know, nonsense he's going to say. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so I wait for it, you know, and I'm ready with my camera and I'm ready to, to catch that moment. Mm -hmm. Even though I don't know in detail what this person is going to say, but I know essentially in essence, what is going so, and I know in essence, of course, what what children who are the children of the revolution are are saying, mm -hmm. and then I find the, my 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 choice are the two girls which you saw in the, in the movie, which are extremely politicized, extremely intelligent, extremely generous and uh, and warm and and beautiful. They they are the the ones that speak for, for that speak, to, to, who are the prophets. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So, um, thank you. Uh, it's it's it was probably answered uh, answer for the third question, and also uh, Barbara was asking about uh, the collaborators uh, in the place. How how did you uh, acquire them, or how did you ask them to participate uh, in the shooting? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about? About your your local, I would I would say I would expect it's it's local collaborators in Cuba. Um, yes, I mean, as I said, I was I was teaching at the international film school, so I had uh, people around me who, who could help. I had my my friend uh, Fenya, who is who is this uh, very smart uh, guy from Chile, who is also a film film teacher. Uh, my assistants were mainly from from Mexico, uh, because uh, it's culturally near, and uh, and uh, and I could find I, I knew a lot of people before in Mexico, so I have a lot of good friends there. Um, I was actually writing the script in Mexico, mm -hmm. so, and um, so yeah, it's it's. Uh, I don't need a lot of people around me, you know, I, I, I work in a very minimalistic way, I think in the most extremely minimalistic in, in, in a technological sense. Mm -hmm. I, I use very small cameras and people always ask me what kind of cameras I, I don't even know what it's called. It's, it's this, this size and it's a Handycam <laughs> Sony, I mean, high resolution, but it's not, uh, I mean, I, I saw tourists in Havana who had, had bigger cameras than me. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, uh, and it's not the size of the camera that makes a movie. And it's not, a, it's not the number of cables and, uh, and uh, lights you carry around. Uh, sure. So it's, uh, it's essentially what comes out of your heart and your brain. Yes. <laughs> I, would, I would totally agree yeah. on that. Um, well, our time is almost up, so uh, I will just ask our uh, attendees and visitors if they want to place any question, just to just please do so, uh, because we will be finishing in a couple of minutes, I expect. Uh, before that, I would ask uh, about uh, one of your cooperators, which is uh, Una Chaplin, who has a special role in, in, in the movie and uh, having a, a wonderful bits of uh, singing and playing guitar um how how did you came up with the idea to involve her uh, in the film or was it was it just a coincidence i tried to push her out of the film but she made it back <laughs> really no i'm joking <laughs> no no she's uh, she's a great friend and uh, for for a while and she came i i showed her Im images and videos from from the, the footage I had with the children and she came from LA for a few weeks and she was just in love with the kids like me and uh, it was a very lucky strike 
Lunes uh, has spent part of her childhood in Cuba when she was a kid. Mm -hmm. My father from Chile. Uh, is, uh, Patricio uh, is, is a great filmmaker too. He went, he ran away from Pinochet and mm -hmm. came to Cuba in exile. So, so um, uh, yeah, Una was, was really the perfect match. She, she's she's uh, smart, uh, beautiful, very, very uh, polit politically aware. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and she comes from this uh, great family that has to do with uh, cinema in a very, very amazing way. <laughs> There's a certain guy called Charlie in her family. <laughs> Have you, was it, did it influence, <laughs> did it influence the screenings you, you, you presented to the children or was it, uh, was it this direct uh, coincidence or direct relation that... <laughs> She's well, watching. I didn't tell the children that, that Una was the grandchild of Charlie Chaplin. I didn't tell them. Oh, but, so they, but, they didn't know. They didn't know. But but then when we showed pictures of uh, the great dictator, mm -hmm. uh, films of, of, of old films of, of Chaplin, uh, I said, like, for a joke, I said, this is uh, Una is the grandchild, grandchild of, of this man. And then somebody in the audience said, so she's Hitler's granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she said what the fuck and i said this is this is really a funny moment i love it and uh, everyone was like oh so you're japanese kind of that well, was pretty, uh, i suppose it's not recorded otherwise it will be in the film right <laughs> this 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 moment <laughs> it is i think you didn't see the film no, I mean asking, uh, asking her if she's Hitler's granddaughter. It's it is in the film. It is. Oh, really? I must yeah. have missed it. I'm sorry. It's... So it shows that you didn't see the film in the cinema. No, I've seen. I I promise I've seen it, but uh, this it's in the film. It's like five five minutes before the end. Okay, I might have missed it for some reason. Maybe you don't want to hear about Hitler. I don't know. You're okay, so. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> especially with our Czech experience. Um, so um, our time is up. So I'm just asking okay. our audience whether uh, they want to ask uh, final questions. Final question. One more question. But no, I can't see any reactions. So it was my pleasure, Hubert, to uh, talking to you. And uh, I hope there will be chance to, to meet with the audience and with you uh, in the future. Uh, out of this COVID madness uh, in person. So thank you very much for your time and for your thank answers. You. I'm greeting you to Islav. I'm, I'm sorry I cannot come, of course. Well, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll make it one day uh, <laughs> with yeah. the next movie. <laughs> okay. Inshallah, one day I will come. It's, uh, it's near my home. my home. Yeah. And good luck with the film nice in, in, in Spain and in Valladolid Festival. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.